Thanks both of you for, for the introduction and thanks um, for having me here. It's lovely to be here. My first time in Dublin, as it happens. Um, I always get uncomfortable with those very, those very generous introductions because now I feel gonna, I'm going to do the talk and it'll be a massive deflation. Yeah. Um, but let's hope not. So yeah, I'm going to talk um, about uh, the, the, the substance of, of the new book, which is out in a couple, in a couple of weeks with the same title. Um, it's a very grandiose title. Um, I, won't, I don't take the blame for that. That's the publisher's fault. Um, I remember with the last book, they, they came up with the subtitle, Why Do Asset Managers Own the World? And I said, I said, that's not really what the book's about. And they said, we don't really care. <laughs> and it's a little bit the same this time. Um, so there's obviously, I think there's, I think there's probably lots of different reasons one could argue why capitalism won't save the planet. And, and I'm only going to be talking about one of, of those, um, uh, at least one that I think applies or that is true, um, but it's one that um, I don't think has been talked about very much. So that's why the book tries to uh, draw attention to it and, and, and talk about it. So I'm just going to um, get straight into it. Um, and I want to start by oh, that one. Um, okay, yeah, that's my first slide. So I'm going to be talking today about electricity, um, which hopefully um, won't, be, won't be too boring, um, but hopefully I'm going to persuade you that uh, electricity is, well, first of all, it's very complicated, but it's also very, very important. And um, obviously one of the um, reasons that it's important um, is its role in climate change. So this, this is a, a chart that can begin to help us kind of put some numbers and, and, and um, scale to this. This is from 2019. The numbers haven't changed much since then. They would have changed a little bit. But if you look, so if you start on the left um, and look at uh, greenhouse gases um, that are emitted into the atmosphere, about three quarters, so about 75% is carbon dioxide. And then if you take carbon dioxide emissions, about 75% again of carbon dioxide emissions are due to the uh, combustion of fossil fuels, so oil, uh, gas and coal, and then there's about another 25% uh, related to things like land use change. And then if you just take that fossil fuel combustion, that 75%, electricity generation is the biggest single component of that. So electricity generation, the generation of carbon dioxide through the burning of... Um, a little bit of oil, but mainly gas and coal, natural gas and coal, is the, big, the single biggest cause today of greenhouse gas uh, emissions. So that's one reason for focusing on electricity, uh, which is one I'm going to be talking about today. Um, but I think, I think it's important to point out that electricity is important to climate futures, in a sense, less because of, of how significant it is today, but even more so because of how much more significant it's going to become in the future. And so what I mean by that is that um, for all sorts of different reasons that, that we don't need to get into today, but basically the, pow the powers that be around the world have essentially decided that um, the best strategy for um, climate mitigation in terms of what are currently fossil fuel intensive activities is through electrification. So take road transportation would be the best example of that, right? Or the most obvious example of that. So how do you, how do you decarbonise road transportation? Well, you can either change from fossil fuels, from a petroleum, to another fuel, um, whatever that other fuel might be, some kind of biofuel, or you can move to battery-based uh, motors that are charged and run through electricity. And that's essentially, the, 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 the world has essentially kind of bet the house on electrification. So the main strategy for decarbonising things like transportation, the building sector, and all sorts of different industrial processes, is you electrify them, and then you, then you generate that electricity renewably. Um, and that's the basic strategy that the world has adopted, right or wrong, that's the way we're going. And so what that means is that electricity is going to become much, much more important in terms of overall energy supply and demand 
in the future than it is today. And so this, this chart is taken from the, um, the IEA, the International Energy Agency. And all you need to look at is the top line. Um, so this is, this is their um, scenario, prognosis, whatever you want to call it, for reaching net zero by 2050. And so what, they, what their, um, their modelling suggests is that the share of electricity in total final energy consumption globally will go up from about 20% which is where it is today. So electricity is about 20% of total energy delivery right now to somewhere closer to 50% as you electrify things like road transportation and buildings and all that sort of stuff. So electricity demand globally is expected to, to go up massively around the world in the future, which means that it's even more important to decarbonize electricity generation because electricity is going to become much, much more important in the future. So that's why we're talking about electricity, and that's why so much of the focus um, uh, on mitigation strategies is around decarbonising electricity generation, because electricity is going to become more and more important. So we're talking about electricity for those reasons. So I'm going to be focusing specifically on solar and wind um, today in, in, what, in what I talk about. And again... The, the reasons that I'm going to be focusing on solar and wind are not, are not necessarily because I personally think that solar and wind are what we should be focusing upon. Um, one could very well focus instead or in addition on nuclear um, or on hydropower, both of which are, um, are uh, essentially carbon-free uh, methods of, of generating electricity. But... Just as the world has essentially decided that electrification is going to be kind of the overarching macro strategy for decarbonisation, so the world has essentially decided that solar and wind are what we are betting on. Now, that doesn't mean that we're giving up on nuclear or hydro, far from it, but it does mean that pretty much anywhere you look around the world, the bulk of the investment in carbon-free electricity is occurring in solar and wind and is expected to continue to occur in solar and wind. And so that's why I'm focusing on solar and wind because that's where the energies are being, uh, the political and economic energies are being uh, focused right now and will continue to be focused. And again, there's a nice graph from um, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, that shows this. So again, this is their... Um, NZE, the net zero by 2050 scenario. Um, they show the same things left and right, but the left is in absolute terms, electricity generation by source, and the one on the right is proportionally um, by source. And as you can see, <coughs> the, the light blue line and the light brown line, which are the lines for solar and wind, is where essentially all the growth is expected to occur, again, this is globally, um, in, the, in the next few decades. Um, and so if you look on the right, you can see that solar and wind go from being just over, uh, just around, I think in 12, 2021, they were 12% globally, solar and wind. Um, that Those two combined will be nearly 70% by 2050 under the IEA's central scenario. Um, hydro, if you look, which is the dark blue block, um, is currently about 15%. Is expect, that's expected to go down a little bit. So there'll be modest absolute growth in hydro, but its share will go down because, of course, as I said, we can have a, a rapidly expanding overall pie of electricity generation. And then nuclear... Um, in the yellow is currently just under 10% and the IEA thinks that it will stay at about 9-10% over the next few decades. So there will be investment in hydro, there will be investment in nuclear, but that's not where the, where the game is at. That is absolutely there. They will kind of hold their shares just about. Um, but what will eat into fossil fuel generation, um, which you can see at the moment is principally coal, um, um, but also a huge chunk of, of natural gas as well, and a little bit of oil, what will eat into fossil fuels will be solar and wind. 
again, you know this story from reading newspapers and listening to podcasts and so on, I'm sure, um, at some level, but this is the detail um, of, of what's expected. Um, and so that's why the focus on solar and wind. Now, what I'm going to be talking about is, is essentially the economics of solar and wind and the economics of the development of, of solar and wind. And where, I, and where I want to start is with another chart. So, and, and the reason I'm going to start with this is that this chart, or charts that look pretty much like this, has become the dominant way of understanding the economic drivers of the transition from fossil fuels to renewables in electricity generation. And, and much of what I'm doing, or at least trying to do in the book, is shift that discourse away from this type of um, um, lens of looking at things. I don't think it's a particularly helpful way of understanding things. So what this what this chart is, and I'll like, I'll come back to what I mean by all that in a, in a second. But what so in very simple terms, what this chart is, is it shows um, at different points in time historically, so right up to the present day, it shows the, the the costs of generating electricity through different sources. So through solar, through wind, through nuclear, um, through uh, uh, through gas, through coal. And so on. And what it what it means by the um, by the levelized cost of electricity is basically what what this chart does is it, it shows the average expected lifetime cost of generating electricity over the life of a generating car, which might be say 45 years, 40 45 years for a conventional natural gas fire plant, 30 years for a solar farm, maybe 25 years for an onshore or offshore wind farm. So it, it takes the expected costs at that date over the whole lifetime and the expected amount of <coughs> electricity that will be generated over that lifetime and then averages it out um, to, the, to the present day. And what you can see is that if you go back to 2009, which not that long ago, um, what you could see was that in relative terms, solar was very, very expensive. Um, the dark, the dark uh, black line, and then wind was less expensive, but it was still substantively more expensive than gas in particular, um, but also coal. And so, for a long time, this was kind of this was this was this was great stuff for the advocates of fossil fuels and the opponents of renewables because they could say. It's crazy to transition to solar and wind because, look, they're much more expensive generating sources. And so this, that, was, that was one of the main arguments that was um, put forward. But obviously what's happened over the last decade or more is that the, the, the costs of generating electricity through solar and wind have come down dramatically, particularly in the case of solar. So that by the mid-2000, around about 2014-15, most estimates, this is just Lazard's, um, is, is one of the most influential, but a host of organisations produced similar estimates. By then, almost all those estimates were showing that actually it was, it was pretty much as, as cheap or as expensive, pretty much the same cost to generate electricity through, through solar and wind as through gas or natural or through coal. And then it actually became cheaper, and it's been cheaper ever, ever since, actually. They have been the lowest ever since. And so around that, that trajectory of relative cost, there has built up this narrative, which has basically said what Bill McKibben, who's obviously a very famous um, climate change activist, campaigner on the left, said in this quote, and I, I produced this quote um, because it's, it's kind of emblematic of this wider discourse which is the following. So, so, so McKibben said, economics will clearly take care of the problem, i.e. the problem of the energy transition. The low price of solar, and we can add wind, the low price of solar and wind power will keep pushing us to replace liquid fuels with electricity generated from the sun. And eventually, and then he gets into a kind of hyperbole here, no one will have a gas boiler in the basement or an internal combustion engine in the car. So the argument there was essentially that once you got to cost parity, the problem had been solved. 
that the economics of the transition were resolved, and you can, and you can actually read this in any number of, of publications in the last 10 years, and I'd add on either the left or the right, who basically say the, th the same thing. The economics have been solved, and now the only remaining, the only meaningful remaining obstacles to a, rap to a more rapid transition in electricity generation are not economic. They are political, so, you know, vested interests, um, inertia, and in particular, they're kind of bureaucratic. So you can read any number of articles about, you know, the problem is a slow permitting system. It gets, takes too long to get planning permission for a new wind farm. It takes too long to get the grid connection for a new solar plant, and so on. And so on. There's dozens of articles the FT and the economists produce on this all the time. And my, the, my basic argument that I make in this book is, sure, those are still problems, but actually the economics is still a massive problem as well. The economics hasn't been resolved. Um, and there's pretty good evidence for that, which is that despite the fact that it's been cheaper since 2014, the transition's still not really happening. And this is the kind of the, 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 the I guess, the kind of the, the most gruesome chart that you can produce to show this, which is that basically the amount of electricity we are generating from fossil fuels is still going up. So this was from, this is through, to, so you had a little dip because of COVID um, in 2020, but then it went up again in 2021, it went up again in 2022, and the latest, so around middle of last year, there was lots of people saying 2023 is going to be the, first, going to be the beginning of the decline. But, but the latest data I've seen suggests, it, again, it hasn't happened. It's gone up again in 2023. So yes, renewables are growing. Of course they're growing. But then they're, they're proving purely supplemental to rather than substitutive of fossil fuel-based electricity generation. And, and, and what, I, what I argue in the book is that there's a, one of the many reasons for that is still economic. And it's a very basic economic reason which is essentially, and you don't want to kind of say it too loud because people don't want to hear it, but developing and operating and owning solar and wind farms and selling the electricity that they generate is actually just not a very good business. You don't make much money doing it. And given that we live in a, in a, in a capitalist system dictated by the profit motive, and, and given that in almost every country around the world, that you can think of. China is, I think, a very significant exception to this, and I talk quite a lot about China in the book, but everywhere else, the basic strategy for the energy transition has been to outsource it to the private sector. That's what, that's what the world has done. The world has, the world has basically said, we are expecting you, the private sector, to drive the transition away from, fo from fossil fuels and towards solar and wind in electricity generation, which does not mean that the government has no role, but the government's role is one of kind of nudging. It's, it's providing incentives to essentially, the argument, like the way I put it in the book, is essentially to kind of keep things just about, prof keep profits high enough to maintain the private sector's interest. And actually, I mean, I, I, I can talk more about this later, but actually what you find is that... And so what the, argu what the argument always was was that once those costs had come down to parity, then, the, then the, the historic subsidies and support mechanisms that governments provided to solar and wind could be safely removed. They had done their job, they'd got the cost down to parity, and then the government could say, OK, it's, now it's over to, to the private sector completely. But every time that governments have tried to do that around the world and they've removed or even just meaningfully reduced subsidies, investment has completely collapsed, which is the best evidence that there is of the fact that the private sector development of renewables is still completely de dependent globally on subsidy. So this is a chart, this is a chart um, that I've taken. This is from Shell's, um, a Shell investor presentation. Um, and I just wanted to, to, produce, to show this because it shows some in, interesting and important contrast. And what this is, <coughs> so IRR, many of you will know what an IRR is, but not everyone in the room will. So IRR basically means 
is, is, is internal rate of return, which is the level of returns um, that different that shells different businesses, different parts of what it does. Um, it generates. So what it means by hurdle rate is these are the level of returns that they require a project to be expected to generate before they will put money into that project. And power generation is renewables. That's what that's what power generation is. Uh, electricity generation for Shell. And what you can see is that compared to the other parts of its business, so up means upstream, that's the main business, which is drilling and exploiting oil and gas, is 15%. That's what they require. So all the projects that they are still investing in worldwide are fully expected to generate returns of higher than 15%. Most of them generate way in excess of that these days. But power generation, they say the expected profitability is around 6 is around six by far the least profitable of both of their business. Now, you might say, well, that's just Shell saying <coughs> this, um, and maybe they just say that as an excuse for why they're not putting any money into renewables, but actually the, precisely the same estimates for the profitability of renewables are produced by independent actors as well as, as, well as Shell. Any report you read, mostly it comes in the range of 5 to 8% is the, expect, is the returns that you would expect on, on a renewables project these days. And actually, when you think about it, when you can get 5% just putting your money in the bank, or 6% putting them in, in treasuries, um, 6 to 8%, um, and a much level, greater level of risk, is not a very attractive proposition. So renewables is, not a very profitable, is, is generally not a very profitable business. And, and the argument of the book is that that is why it's still going relatively slowly and too slowly because it's just not a very attractive business. Now, what I want to do in the, in the, t the rest of the time I, I have available is, is give a bit of a snapshot into the arguments that the book puts forward as to why that's the case. So wh why, despite that fall in costs, in generating costs, is renewable still not a particularly <coughs> attractive business in, profit in profitability terms? Because it kind of doesn't make it, it kind of make, doesn't make sense, right? You would think that, well, if the cost of, of generating electricity from solar and wind have gone down so much, then the profits should go up, right? That's kind of the count. That's the kind of the intuitive economic sense. Um, but I want to kind of get into some of the reasons, which I think are really interesting reasons. But I'm a bit of a nerd, so maybe I would say that uh, as to why that's the case. And I'm going to talk about three different factors that militate against. Um, um, strong profitability in renewables. And so the first of them that I want to talk about, appropriately enough, is, 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 a, geograph is a geographical one. Um, so what the, the best way to introduce that, I think, is, with a chart, is a chart like this. And I just took this off the internet um, at random, but you could, you could find something similar for um, an electricity supplier in pretty much any country around the world. So what this is from California, and as it says at the bottom, this, this this was a screenshot I took. is a standard le electricity bill in Southern California in January. I can't. I don't even know what year it was. It doesn't matter. But the point. The point that's important is this: is that when you when we buy when we buy electricity as a user, whether we are a household or an, or a corporation or whoever else it is buying the electricity, we are paying for essentially two two sets of things. We're paying. For the, for the electricity to be generated, and then we're paying for that electricity to be, to be distributed, to be delivered from where it is generated to, to where we live. And obviously, if you, if you go around any country, you see these big transmission and distribution systems that deliver that electricity. As this, as this says here, the grids in, so in California, in this particular year, the grid's transmission and distribution costs represented about 70% of the overall electricity bill for any, um, for any user, for any household or user. Now, that percentage, the percentage that is delivery costs, transportation costs, you might call them, versus, ge versus generating costs will vary over time and it varies geographically. But the point is that, well, there are two points. One is that the, the delivery costs are a very big component of the, of the costs of the electricity that we consume. And the second important point is that they've been, they've been going up over, over time. So delivery is becoming more a, a bigger and bigger component of the cost. So now, why is that important? Well, this is where I get to the geography. 
So this is a, this, these, these are two maps of China, as I'm sure you'll, as I'm sure you'll recognize. And again, I could have shown something similar to what I want to talk about here for any major country in the world. So the chart on the, uh, the, chart on the left shows you where all the wind farms are in China, um, pr proportionally. So the darker, then there's the greater density of wind farms. The chart on the right shows you <coughs> where people live in China. And for every country you look at around the world, you see essentially exactly the same mismatch, which is that all the wind and solar generation is concentrated in precisely those parts of the country where people don't live. And in China, so in China, it's in, it's in the north and the northwest, whereas people live in the south and the southeast. In Sweden, where I live, the, the population is, is disproportionately concentrated in the south and the east, like in China, actually. And all the wind resources are, are in the far north. In the UK, it's the same. Disproportionately, it's in Scotland, whereas the, the centre of the population is in the southeast. It's the same in India. It's the same in Germany. It's the same in the US. Everywhere you look. Now, there's an obvious reason for that, right? Which is that your, your costs as a wind farm developer, other than, the, other than the equipment you buy to install a wind farm or a solar farm, so the turbines or the modules or, whatever, or the solar modules or whatever it might, else it might be, is the land, it's, it's, geography, it's geography, that's, that's your main cost. If, if you're offshore, then you're paying uh, like an offshore seabed lease. Onshore, you're either buying the land or you're leasing the land. But either way, land is a massively important component of, you, of your costs, right? Now, that's exactly why um, all, the, all the renewable resources are located where people don't live, because land is cheapest there, right? The, the cost of land in, say, Wyoming is like 1% of the cost of the land in New Jersey. And so it makes sense to, that you are located there. However... What that means is that renewable resources um, entail a disproportionately significant burden on the, the system that we have in any particular country for, de for delivering electricity. If you look at the geography of renewables versus the geography of conventional power plants, so <coughs> gas plants and coal plants, the latter are, mu are, are on average much more closely uh, located to the centres of demand in a, in a particular country. Now, the reason that matters is that, um, is that if you go back to this particular chart, that particular chart is only the, is only the cost of generating electricity. But the, the, the governments and regulators that, um, that develop and manage our electricity systems around the world they attempt to require electricity generators to incur the costs of their locational decisions in terms of what that means on the transmission system. So, and they don't do it perfectly. In fact, they, in fact, they do it far from perfectly, particularly, and I can get into this later, in more detail for anyone who wants to, they do it particularly imperfectly in places like Ireland and the UK where, um, where you don't have at least I don't think so in Ireland, but in the UK you certainly don't have locational pricing for electricity. Where I live in Sweden, they attempt, they attempt to make wind farms and, and other renewables developers <coughs> bear the cost of the locational decisions are done in two ways. So one, and that's the only way it occurs in the UK, is that, is that, the, is that the charges that are levied on a generator are greater the further they are based away from where people live. So, the, so the, the more out back in the middle of nowhere you are, the greater you pay in transmission and delivery charges as a, as a generator. But in Sweden, they do it in other way as well, which is that the price that, that, that as a generator you earn for your, for your electricity and the price that as a consumer you pay for your electricity varies geographically. In the UK, and I think in Ireland's case, that, that's not true. It's the same over the whole country. Certainly in the UK it is. But in Sweden, it's a huge difference. Down in the south of Sweden, on a particular day, the cost of <coughs> electricity can be 
20 times more expensive in Stockholm than it is in the north of the country. And that's precisely a way to incentivize wind farms to base themselves closer to where people live because of this massive burden that this geographical disjuncture places on, um, on the transmission system. But when it comes to profitability, the point is this, is that the, 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 the profitability of being a wind farm owner, selling your electricity, is that it's not just about generating costs. So everyone who produces these charts saying, well, look how cheap it is to generate electricity. Well, it may be cheap to produce it, but A, it won't, it won't be cheap to distribute it. And the generator will be paying costs that are not shown on any of these charts in terms of distributing that energy, and that will be a massively suppressing impact on their profitability. But the other thing is, it's only cheap to produce it because of their locational decision. Like, that's a completely um, misleading measure of the, of the, of the costs that um, those wind farm or solar developers entail for the system as a whole. Because the, the land costs are so cheap, but they're artificially cheap. They're only cheap because they've made that decision to be somewhere else, which, in, which means they entail all sorts of other costs. So the geography of all this is, in, is incredibly important. People like to say, you know, electricity is just electricity. But electricity actually has an economic geography itself. It matters where the electricity is generated. It matters hugely where it's generated. And that geographical aspect of electricity has been, has been essentially completely written out of the story. Um, and as transmission systems around the world, including in the UK, is incre are increasingly creaking under that burden that is generated precisely by renewables being disproportionately located where people don't live. So that's, that's one reason, which is the fact that it's not just about generating costs, it's about total costs. And so once you factor in the costs of delivery, suddenly it doesn't look so cheap to be a renewables operator, as it does based on these charts that are produced and reproduced ad infinitum. So that's the first one, which is a basic geographical point. Um, the second one <coughs> I want to talk about is, is, is different again. So again, uh, this is just um, a, a chart produced um, pretty much at, at random. You could produce a similar thing for any country. So all this does is it shows for a particular day, this was in August 2022 when I happened to be writing what I was working on at the time, um, and it shows for the time of day the market price of electricity, um, uh, which electricity tends to be sold in half, hour, in half hourly blocks is the way it tends to be bought and sold in wholesale markets. So this is the price in euros per megawatt hour in each of those half hourly uh, periods in two geographical areas. So the light um, line is for Spain, and then the darker one is for the Nordic region. The absolute numbers don't matter. The, the, po the only point I want to um, make is that electricity prices are very, very volatile. And they're volatile um, at, at, a very, <coughs> at a very short time scale, so over the course of a day. But they're also volatile over any time frame you care to look at. Electricity prices are unbelievably volatile on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, and on, on, on a yearly basis. They're, they're hugely volatile. And so one of the, and there are, there are all sorts of different implications of that, but I only want to talk about one of them today. And the, the one I want to talk about is this, which is, again, if you go back to, sorry for jumping back and forth, but if you go back to that chart, so again, forget everything I said about the <coughs> delivery costs. So assume that you have a natural gas-fired power plant, a conventional power plant on the one hand, and a wind farm on the other. Forget the facts that they'll have different costs for delivering their electricity, so put that aside for now. And assume that um, their costs just for generating the power are exactly the same. So let's say those lines have just crossed. It's 2014 and they have exactly the same costs for generating their power over their lifetime. And let's also assume that over the course of a day, a week, a month, a year, they produce exactly the same amount of electricity as each other and are able to sell 
exactly the same amount of electricity <coughs> as each other. You would imagine that that meant they would produce exactly the same amount of profit as each other. But again, that's not true because those two power plants might have completely different production profiles in terms of when they generate their power. So one of them might disproportionately generate electricity at times of the day or week or month or year when electricity prices are very, very low. The other one might disproportionately produce its power at times of the day, week or month or year at which electricity prices are very, very high. So even if they, over any time scale, they're producing exactly this same amount of power and selling exactly the same <coughs> amount of power, and even if they have exactly the same amount of costs, they might make completely different levels of profits because the power that they produce has different worth in the marketplace, even if it's exa of exactly the same magnitude. Like if they're producing bottles, for example, th those, those bottles can have very different revenue potentials at different, because they are produced at different times of the day. And the problem, one of the, again, one of the problems with renewables is that renewables developers disproportionately generate their power at times when electricity is, is, is very, very cheap. And so, again, so even if they have exactly the same costs, the revenue potential and therefore the profitability of different generating sources can be very, very different. So, so electricity has a temporality as well as a spatiality. That is, that is very, very important. That, and it gets completely written out of those simplistic narratives that say, well, now that it's cheaper to produce it, it's going to surge ahead because of the assumption that it's going to be more profitable. It's just, it's just not true. It's based on a whole raft of different assumptions. Um, and so the, the geography and the temporality of it are very, very important. Um, and as I said, um, renewables power tends, <coughs> tends to be not very remunerative power. Um, there are also, also all sorts of very other very, very important questions that we could get into around whether you are actually able to sell all of your power. So on very, very windy days, for example, um, it's often the case that, renew that wind farms are producing much more power than there is demand for. But because they can't store that power, they can't store and sell it at a time when it's more expensive. And obviously, it can't be put on the grid because the grid has to be in balance between supply and demand all the time. So what happens to that power? Now, there are some countries around the world. I think pretty sure India is an example, of one example. Vietnam is another example where the authorities basically say, well, sod it you've produced that power but there's no demand for it we're not going to pay you for it but in Ireland and in the UK and other places renewables generators have paid for all of the power they generate irrespective of whether there's any demand for that again it's another kind of hidden subsidy that nobody talks about but it's there um, so they get remunerated for that curtailment and in certain periods in certain parts of the world you get curtailment rates of up to 40, 50, even 60% where 50, 60 percent of the power is being wasted, but still being paid for, even though it's not being used. <clears throat> but even aside from that, even if you assume, as I did earlier, that you're generating the same amount and able to sell the same amount, it doesn't follow that you're generating exactly the same amount of revenue and profitability. The third thing I want to talk about, and I think in a way the <coughs> most kind of fundamental, I think, is the, is the question of competition. Um, so this, this, is, this, this is just a chart from, um, f from the US, which shows the number of uh, electricity generating plants by type. And you can see that the number of renewables, so non-hydro renewables plants, has gone up uh, rapidly over time. And I just wanted to show that to make a very, very simple point, which is that there is a huge amount of competition in electricity generation. Um, you know, I know I said that, that electricity has a, has a spatiality and a temporality, that it means that it has a different worth based on when it's produced and where it's produced. However, at the end of the day, electricity is a, is a commodity. It's an undifferentiated commodity if you leave aside that spatiality and temporality. And selling it is a very, very competitive business. And as um, uh, 
Nick Butler wrote in a really good piece actually in the FT a few years ago, as he said then, the barriers to entry in the renewable sector are pretty low. Anyone can become an electricity producer. Not anyone can become an offshore farm developer, sure. But the barriers to entry in onshore are very, very, very low. Domestic residences become power producers in a way, selling their excess power back on to the grid. And anyone who knows anything about political economy will, will tell you that there aren't many businesses around the world where you have high rates of profitability unless you have <coughs> some pretty um, durable sources of monopoly power, of market power of one kind or another. And in fact, if you go back to the Shell, where was the Shell picture I showed? You know, one of the main reasons why fossil fuels, why drilling for and exploring for oil and gas has been such a profitable business in recent times is that the world of oil and gas production is a world of cartels. OPEC is a cartel, it's the very definition of a cartel. And as soon as global oil prices start dipping, OPEC says we'll just, we'll just cut production to maintain profitability, to maintain revenues and retain uh, profitability in global oil and gas production. There's nothing similar in the renewables world. There's nothing to stop overproduction of renewable power. And all that does is has a depressive impact upon profitability. There's a complete absence of monopoly power, very, very low barriers to entry. And the other thing which I think is, again, which I think is really, really important, is that most of the government mechanisms that exist um, for providing support to the renewable sector do not do anything to um, inhibit competitive pressures. And in fact, in most cases, including across the whole of Europe, they actually kind of exacerbate and encourage competition. And so um, the, the way in which subsidies are provided, support is provided to renewables developers in Europe now is principally through auctions. So what, and I, again, this is something many of you will be aware of the basic details of it, but what, what will happen is that the government directly or, in, or indirectly through a, um, through a utility of some sort will auction off um, capacity for say, uh, will auction off new offshore or onshore capacity where developers are encouraged to bid for a contract to supply electricity at essentially a fi pri fixed price for the next 15 years. And the reason why that's done is because of that electricity price volatility I talked about earlier. So, again, I'll t t I don't want to get into too much detail, but this is really, really, this is actually very, very important to understand. So, if you were, a, if you were to, to, I'll come back to this picture in a minute, but if you want to set up a new wind, say you want to build a new wind farm with 20 turbines and it's going to cost you, I don't know, 100 million pounds to develop that wind farm. You need to do lots of different things in order to do that. But the main thing you need to do is you need to raise the money to, 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 to build that wind farm, right? Now, the main way in which... Um, wind farm developers do that, however big or small they are, is through loan financing. They literally, they go to the bank and they say, I need 100 million pounds to develop a new wind farm. And the bank, the bank manager says, well, how are you gonna be able to pay that back? And the wind farm developer says, well, I'm gonna sell electricity for the next 20 years, and that's how I'll pay it back. And the bank manager says, well, do you know what the electricity price is gonna be <coughs> for the next 20 years? And the wind farm set developer says, actually, I don't even know what it'll be for the next 20 minutes, let alone the next 20 years, because the electricity prices are so volatile. And so governments provide these long-term fixed price contracts precisely to, to mitigate that volatility effect, because otherwise that volatility means it's impossible for wind farm developers to raise the finance. So what the wind farm <coughs> developer will do, will get its contract from the government that says, we will pay you 55 pounds per megawatt hour for the next 15 years. 12 years is the normal length, maybe 15 years. The wind farm developer says, great, then goes to the bank manager and says, look, that's the electricity price for the next 15 years. So you can forget about that volatility that scared you off. This means I'll be able to repay that loan 
um, over the next 15 years. Now, the, the mechanisms whereby governments award those contracts is typically through, reverse, through so-called reversal, reverse auctions, where what they'll do is they'll say to the potential developers, we've got a maximum price that we are willing to <coughs> offer for that contract, let's say it's £60 per megawatt hour. We want you to bid the price down in a so-called reverse auction. So you have the opening price, and then they bid against each other, and the winning bid is the lowest price. So they might bid it down to, say, £45 per megawatt hour, which is the lowest price that a developer thinks it could just about make money on by selling it at that price for the next 12 years, given the cost of financing and given the cost of buying the turbines and so on. So actually, the government mechanisms for supporting renewables <coughs> actually exacerbate and encourage that competitive intensity and have a depressive impact upon profitability. For obvious reasons, right? They want the price of electricity to be low to consumers. But you can't have low prices to consumers while you have high prices, high profits for the renewables developers. So the government mechanism, mechanisms encourage that competitive intensity. And what happens is you end up with fiascos like we had in the UK last year. Again, I'm sure lots of people will, will, will have read about this. It was a beautiful case of government incompetence <coughs> where what had been happening was that because... This is the last time I'll go back to this. Which are, because, the, because those costs had been going down through to 2021... Right? Forget that little uptick at the end. The cost would be going down in these auctions. So maybe in 2017 auction, the winning bid was, say, £55 per megawatt hour. And then the next year, it was £53, the next year, it was £51. <coughs> the cost went down because the developer could bid lower because their, cost, their generating costs were going down. The government said, OK, then we'll, we'll put an even lower um, price ceiling for the auction next year because the, pro the, the, the prices have been going down, so we expect them to continue to go down. But of course, suddenly the costs have been going up because of supply chain pressures, costs of silicon, cost of steel have gone up 20%, interest rates have gone from 0 to 5%. So actually, developers' costs have gone up hugely. But the government was like, well, we still expect you to have come in with these really rock-bottom bids. And the government kind of signalled that it was going to keep that low price. And the developers kind of said to the, to, to, to the Treasury and to Number 10 in England, no one's going to bid. The price ceiling's too low. No one's going to bid. We can't make money at that price. The government went ahead with the auction anyway and had zero bids. It was a complete fiasco. They thought that basically the, the industry was like bluffing, was trying to pull the wool over there. Oh, the industry wasn't bluffing. The industry was telling the truth. And there were zero bids. So the auction was a complete failure. So that it, competition, I would say, is the, is, the, is the factor that across the world pu pushes. And what you tend to find, if you, if you look at the kind of the history, and I, I'm nearly done <coughs> now, if I, I, don't know, I have no idea how long I've been going on. Um, if you look at the history of um, renewables development in pretty much any country in the world, it goes through these boom-bust boom cycles where the government will introduce a new subsidy mechanism and it will, it will look like, and in some cases it, it will be true that there will be decent profits to be made, and suddenly there's a huge inrush of development capital because there's low barriers to entry, so money rushes in, and it ends up having this massively depressive impact on profitability, and so you have short booms followed by relatively long busts. And you, we've seen that in India, we've seen it in China, we've seen it in the UK, um, we've seen it in pretty much every, every territory that there is. Um, but overall and over the long duration, the profitability is, is, is not very good. And so kind of where I end up at, and this is, this is a, a quote from the book, where I, so what I don't really do in the book is say, is say what the answer is, because I'm one of those geographers who's much better at kind of pointing out problems than coming up with, it's always much easier. Um, but I think that there is in here an argument for publicly developed renewable power, which is, which is basically like, well, as I say here, but, if you, but the argument would be the reason for favouring public ownership in this case wouldn't be like a, a, the kind of classic lefty objection, which is kind of rampant private sector profit. It's kind of the opposite. It's like 
the public, the state needs to do it because the private sector can't make enough profit out of doing it. And we're sort of relying on the profitability to drive the development, but the, the, the profitability isn't there. And it isn't there even though those, those support mechanisms remain ubiquitous around the world. Um, and it isn't there even though those, those costs um, have come down. And, 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 it's, and, it, and I think that the, you know, the, tell, the telltale sign of where things are at, at the moment is that, so you might have read recently there was a there was a there was re, there was wonderful enthusiasm about the fact that um, installations of um, <coughs> of of renewables uh, globally jumped by fifty percent last year. It was the biggest ever increase in renew, and everyone was oh fantastic, we're flying, we're surging ahead, um, but ninety percent of the increase was in China. So essentially. There was no change really in the whole of the rest of the world, and so all the headlines forgot about the, again the, geog the geography of this. But essentially, all of the of the progress, the incremental progress that has been made in the last couple of years has been made in China, because in China, it's, it's not the prof it's not it's not prof it's not the profitability motive that is driving things. It's Beijing that's basically so ninety five percent of the wind development sector in China is state owned companies ninety five percent. In the rest of the world, it's 95% privately owned. It's the exact obverse in the rest of the world to in China. And so in China, if Beijing wants something done, it just does it through its state-owned companies and financed by state-owned banks. And so that's the one, play, the one place where things are progressing very, very rapidly is the one place where you have kind of a totalitarian state that can get things done very, very quickly when it wants to, whereas we're relying on nudging the private sector, and those nudges are not, are not, are not working. And I think that the, the pro one of the big problems I see is that if, if you listen to what, for example, Labour has been saying in the UK the last couple of years, they're saying, we're going to drive renewables much faster than the Tories, and that, at the same time, that's going to bring down consumer energy bills, because look, solar and wind are so cheap, and it's like... No, 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 they're not. They're really, really not cheap. They're cheap if you look at those simplistic graphs that ignores all the grid costs and the relative revenue ability of those. And so there's a complete lack. The more you read into the stuff, the more you realise there's a complete lack of understanding amongst many of the policymakers and many of their... And I excuse civil servants, of course, from these, uh, from these sorts of sweeping assertions, but amongst many of the advisers... Um, to them, partic particularly on energy questions. There's a, com there's a complete lack of understanding of how, en of how energy markets work. So, the, so Labour, for example, um, you might have heard, Labour is one of its big plans is this entity called Great British Energy, which is going to be a, a, British, a, a great British energy. Of course, it's got to be great. Um, a publicly owned renewables developer, which frankly will be tiny, and it will be kind of a gnat on the hide of the private sector. But nonetheless... So I, 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 had, I met last year with one of the, uh, one of the advisors to, to one of the parts of the, of the government that would be working on this, and I, and I was talking to him about the plans for Great British Energy, and I said, well, you know, how is Great British Energy going to sell, sell it to electricity generators? Is it going to sell it in wholesale markets, or is it going to sell it under long-term long power purchase contracts with corporations? Or, you know, th th that sort of thing. And they said, oh, they haven't thought about that. Yeah, so there you go. Um, and so I'm going to leave it there. Um, I hope it didn't get too, too much into the detail, but you, but you kind of have to get into the detail. Thank you.